Hey, did you guys hear who won the Nobel Prize in Economics? Nobody. Nobody won because the Nobel Prize in Economics does not exist. And yes, I will die on this very pedantic hill. Alfred Nobel established five categories of prizes in his will. Physics, chemistry, medicine, literature, and peace. And that is it. But in 1968, a Swedish bank created a prize in memory of Nobel to be given yearly to economists, possibly as a way to launder the reputation of economists and establish them as serious scientists and not sociopaths who put a price on absolutely everything and value it over all other metrics. Tons of actual Nobel laureates and living members of the Nobel family hate the Economics Prize and argue that Alfred Nobel would have hated it too. The committee that hands out the prize hasn't really done themselves any favors in this regard by handing the award out to people like Milton Freeman, who created Reaganomics, wanted to deregulate pharmaceuticals and abolish the post office, and once famously advised Chilean dictator Augusto Pinochet. In 1993, they gave the award to one of Friedman's students, Robert Fogel, whose most famous work was about how Southern slaveholders were very very rational because they benefited financially from slavery, which honestly is fine. Like, yeah, pointing out that slaveholders were making a profit from exploiting the labor of the people they enslaved, it did go against the mainstream beliefs at the time, but it's not exactly shocking. But in the same book, he did argue that because slaves made them so much money, slaveholders treated them pretty well, all things considered. Like, whipping wasn't an everyday kind of thing. <laughs> anyway, the reception of that book was so bad, he had to write an entire second book explaining that he definitely doesn't think slavery was a good thing, which is pretty funny. Uh, also, he was married to a black lady at a time when, you know, there were still anti-miscegenation laws on the books. So I don't actually think he was really racist. I think he was just very much an economist. And when he wrote that first book, he forgot to also try to be a human, which, you know, it seems like that's a problem a lot of economists run into. I can't wait for the hate mail from economists. I'm not talking about you. You are totally human, economist that is about to send me an angry email. <laughs> anyway, this year's award has gone to one of Fogel's students. So it's like Milton Freeman's intellectual grandchild in a way, Claudia Golden. And despite the dodgy output of some of her Chicago school forebears, I actually think Golden is pretty cool and deserving of a big shiny award, whether it's technically a Nobel Prize or not. Even if you, like me, don't really pay much attention to economics on a day-to-day -day basis, you may have actually heard of some of her research, which tends to lean more into history and sociology than pure economics. There's at least one of her studies that I'm pretty sure I've referenced on this channel channel in the past. Orchestrating Impartiality, the Impact of Blind Auditions on Female Musicians, published in the year 2000 in American Economic Review. Golden hypothesized that women were discriminated against in orchestras. You know, most orchestras are made up of mostly men. So she asked people holding real auditions to use a screen between the hiring committee and the musicians so that they couldn't tell if the musicians were men or women. Using the screen increased the chances that a woman would make it to the next round of auditions by 50%, and it increased her chances of being hired by several fold. It sounds like a relatively simple study, but the actual paper is 24 pages long with an extra 50 pages of appendices and 909 references. Every paragraph has an entire master's thesis hiding in it, like when she randomly tosses out that in order to figure out why women were discriminated against in an orchestra, she examined rosters from 1960 to 1996, finding that the average female musician took 0 0.067 leaves per year, whereas the average male musician took 0 0.061, a difference that is not statistically significant, and that their length of leave was trivially different. She was also able to rule out tenure differences, turnover, and leaves of absences. She builds an incredibly dense case for the lack of women in orchestras being due to bog-standard discrimination, with music directors even 
stating publicly that they just don't think women have the same level of musical skill as men. That influences their hiring decisions, but when they don't know they're listening to a woman, suddenly the women can get hired. That's not even her most influential work, but I hope it gives you an idea of why she won this prize. Not because of one revolutionary idea or theory, but a lifetime of very careful, very detailed work in a field that had been overlooked before she came along, specifically women's economic value in the workplace. Another landmark study from Golden is The Power of the Pill, Oral Contraceptives and Women's Career and Marriage Decisions, which lays out the substantial evidence for oral contraception drastically changing the lives of women in the 1970s, who suddenly gained control of their lives to the point where they could delay marriage, finish their education, and enter the workforce in droves never before seen. But the work I find most interesting is her 2014 study, A Grand Gender Convergence, Its Last Chapter. For the past few decades, I've had men explain to me that the gender wage gap in which women are paid less than men does not exist. When presented with clear data showing it does exist, men have explained to me that that's only because men choose to go into more lucrative careers. When presented with clear data showing the gender gap exists even between women and men who are working the exact same job, men have explained to me that that's only because men are more skilled and thus deserve more pay. So it's somewhat satisfying for a Nobel Prize, sort of, to go to a woman who not only proves that the gender wage gap is real, but who went on to demonstrate the reasons why it exists and how society must change in order to finally close that gap, to write the last chapter in the story of women's climb to economic equity. Golden had previously found that as women first entered the workforce in large numbers, they did have less education, less relevant experience, which could explain why they were paid less. But over time, thanks in part to the birth control pill, more women completed higher education before starting their careers, eventually equaling men. And as expected, that narrowed the wage gap. But as those explainable factors came into play and were dismissed, Golden saw that unexplainable wage discrimination drastically increased, more than doubling, in fact. Women were taking two steps forward, but employers were pushing them one step back. Golden presented reams of data that suggest one of the major drivers of this wage discrimination is the way employers reward longer, continuous hours worked and punish time flexibility. But it might not be exactly what you're originally thinking of, or at least it's not what I originally thought of. You know, I would expect employees who work more hours to get paid more money. But what Golden found was that it's not linear. So if you imagine that you're working a part-time retail job where the pay is $10 an hour, Uh, I worked 20 hours this week, I earned $200. But my coworker, who was hired on at the same time and supposedly the same rate as me, worked 30 hours and somehow ends up earning $500. And next year, they're going to be making even more and even more the year after that until I am left in the dust. And to make matters worse, let's say I also want that magical extra bonus money, so I bump up to 30 hours a week too. My coworker is working 10 hours a day, the same three days a week, um, but I can't do the same because let's say I'm still in college, I need a flexible schedule where I might work more hours on one day, fewer the next, Uh, sometimes I need to take a week off for finals. When we get our paychecks, we worked the same amount of hours, but I got $300 and they got $500. Why? Golden discovered that employers place exorbitant value on hours worked and they actively punish flexibility. And this explains why today men and women tend to enter the labor force with no wage gap between them. Uh, But over time, that gap widens, particularly around the time that women begin having children. They must leave work to actually give birth, and then if they return to work months later, they're punished with lower pay. 
If they work fewer hours to spend more time raising their child, they're punished for that. If they work the same number of hours as their male colleagues, but now they need a more flexible schedule due to being the primary person running their household or just needing to pump milk, they're punished again. As an economist, Golden's proposed solution to all of this isn't men should probably step up to help raise their kids or the government should mandate and enforce salary transparency. Her solution is instead an economical one. Women being underpaid makes the entire economy less efficient, and so employers and everyone else would theoretically benefit by no longer punishing flexibility and over-rewarding total hours worked above all else. This is all particularly interesting right now when employers are fighting tooth and nail against the work-from-home movement that started during the COVID pandemic. Many employees say that they're happier working from home, that they're more productive, that Working from home saves their employer money on keeping offices full of computers and air conditioners running, and that they now have more flexibility to adjust their hours around the needs of their families. Meanwhile, employers say work from home is bad actually for reasons. <laughs> Golden's research makes me wonder if employers embrace work from home, would that be the start of that final chapter of the wage gap? And would it just make all of us happier? Like work from home, flexible job hours uh, and lower job hours, it's not for every career. There will always be jobs that you just cannot do from your sofa. There will always be jobs that by definition require a strict set schedule or long hours. But Golden points out that there are a huge number of jobs that can be made more flexible and that don't require 60 or even 40 hours of work each week, uh, especially because of our ongoing technology jumps that have made it easier to produce more work more efficiently. We don't necessarily need to be spending 60 hours in the office. We just need employers to start to understand that. But while we're waiting on our employers to recognize how happy employees might benefit them, maybe some extra male responsibility and government mandates wouldn't be such a bad idea. Anyway, uh, as always, there's a link below in the doobly-doo. It'll take you to my Patreon, where there is a transcript of this video with links to everything I've talked about. If I've piqued your interest, I highly recommend you go read some of Golden's papers. They're available in full for free online, and they're actually surprisingly readable, despite being very long and at times quite dense. Um, or you can check out the scientific background paper published by the Ersatz Nobel Committee, also available for free online, also linked in my transcript. Hey everybody, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a like. If you loved the video, please subscribe. And if you think the world could use more videos like this and you happen to have a few bucks laying around, head to patreon.com slash Rebecca and join an awesome community of nerds like the people whose names you see on the screen right now. Thanks.